My guest today is Tanisha DaCosta. Tanisha is the founder of Kingdom Kids Empowerment Academy, a K-12 micro school with a focus on the whole child that operates on the campus of an HBCU, a historically black college and university in North Carolina. Tanisha launched her school in October of 2023 and recently moved to the HBCU campus. She currently has about 15 students who are enrolled for the upcoming academic year, uh, many of whom attend tuition free due to North Carolina's school choice policies. Tanisha worked in public schools for a number of years. She also holds an MBA and is currently pursuing a doctorate degree in educational leadership. She's a mom of five, uh, ranging in age from 30 to seven, uh, and also a grandmother to two, and a couple of her students attend her micro school. So we'll hear all about Tanisha's story. Tanisha DaCosta, welcome to the Liberated Podcast. Well, thank you for having me at Liberated. It's very exciting to be here. It's great to have you here. Uh, so much to talk about in terms of your entrepreneurial journey, but I'd love to start with what drew you to education to begin with? What's sort of your background and how did you find your way into the K-12 space? It's so odd. Um, so obviously being a grandmother, I'm kind of up there. So it really started... Um, Early on, I've always wanted to be in some form of education. When I originally started my work career, I worked um, from 18 to about 20 with developmentally disabled as a direct care staff, just helping them with activities of daily living. Um, again, still just trying to figure myself out. Uh, once I had my son at 25, I told my husband, I just didn't want to go back to work. So, but I needed to help pay bills. So that's how our house was set up. So I opened a daycare in my home and again, 25 years old, two children at this point, um, we were highly successful. Like I stumbled on my passion. I'm like, I really love children. I love talking to them, connecting to them at, at this young age. Um, and so then I raised my children, the few that the, the three that I have um, until they went to kindergarten. So I sent them to a, a, a charter school called Westminster Community Charter School. And when I say it was community-based, it was truly rooted and grounded in the community. So much so that parents had to drop their children off. If it wasn't a parent, it had to be a family member. And the rationale was the principals, the teachers, the staff want to be able to touch every child, speak to every child, engage in every person who's connected to that child. I loved it. And this was in an area that was, you know, I guess you would say impoverished and parents made their way to get their children to school. And so when I saw that that could work and that if people respected the process, they fall into the process, I got intrigued. Still had my daycare center at the time, well, my home-based daycare. I took a meeting with the principal. I was just so, and, and, and I just loved how she moved and, and got things done. And I saw that she was not just an educator, she was a businesswoman. And at the time, while I was running my day here, managing my children, I was also in school at night to get my bachelor's in business. And so I saw a way to make that a connection, because what I also saw was that a lot of people work in nonprofit, but don't have business acumen. And then vice versa, people work in business, but don't care about people. That's a problem. So I was like, how can I make these two come together and be friends? And so... Um, when I took the meeting with her, she sort of discouraged me because she said, well, you're in school finishing up getting your bachelor's. Again, at this time, I'm 27, so I'm not a young learner. And she's like, you'll have to go back and get an education degree if you want to do what I'm doing, be a principal of a school. And I'm thinking, no, I'm, I'm not getting rid of this education and I'm not going backwards. If I get another degree, it's going to be a master's. What do I do? So I continue to work. I go into the nonprofit sector. I let my daycare go because at that time, Obama came into office and he said, we're cutting everything. And one of the things they cut was child care. The writing was on the wall. I was about to graduate. So I went on ahead and let my license go and went into nonprofit. Luckily for me, I landed a very flexible nonprofit job in, a ner in the uh, library where I was the coordinator for the community. My job was to work with daycare centers and give them book bundles. Sick. 
My job was to connect people who couldn't read, who couldn't uh, work on a computer with local programs. Perfect. Um, so I did some fun things. I did book clubs uh, where we brought in local authors to read to the community. And we had food prepared by the high school students um, at our cooking. So again, connecting the dots to community and education and what it looks like. Thriving. Grant funded fronts in. I go to another nonprofit and another nonprofit. Last nonprofit I worked before I relocated was a homeless shelter that um, just had walls, no color on the walls, no spoon forks, no food, no snow, nothing. I got the team. I got the implement implementation strategy together, gathered my team. And for several weeks, we went shopping for every single item to get that shelter up and running. We cut the ribbon. We got our first group of women in there. And that's when I realized this is still not it. Like, what is it, Lord? What is? It? Why am I still not fulfilled? Like, I'm doing the work. But I'm an honorary person. I love to do things my way. And I've always been that way since I was a little girl. So <laughs> I moved to Charlotte. I told my husband, like, there has to be more for me in life. Left my children and my husband. At the time, I only had four. And came here alone. Lived with someone I didn't know. Moved in with someone else I didn't know. Came with $1,000 in a suitcase. And I said, I'm betting on myself this time. My brother said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, but I have a degree and I'm not afraid. I'm out. So I left. I came. My husband dropped me off. It was very emotional for six months. I did all types of entrepreneurial things, even cleaning people's toilets because I created my own little cleaning company to sustain me. And then a friend said, you're a good edge. You could be a good teacher. And so by June, I was like, OK, uh, my kids are about to come back. I'm, I got to set up house. I need a job. Um, so he said, why don't you go to the job fair at CMS, Charlotte Mecklenburg schools? I go, I get all dressed up. Um, I go, I go to the first table and got hired on the spot. Like the lady said, no, I don't know why you have all those resumes. We want you. Can you be who we need you to be? I'm your girl. And never taught before. I taught on the college level one semester, but I knew that I could connect and that's all that mattered. And so I got into the school system. First year, I became teacher of the year for my school. Um, I still have buy-in with all these students. They follow me on IG. My grades, I think I hit the 80th percentile of pass rate. No skills, no scaffolding. I don't know what I'm doing. I just know I'm going to give you this information. And I, I, I really, I care about you enough that I want you to win. And so once they realized that and that you couldn't say too much to me that I wouldn't say back to you because we're going to be <laughs> we're going to be in this for the long haul, friends. And so once I got the respect of the children, um, once they knew that I loved them, I really, truly did. Um, they worked, they performed, outperformed. And so that was that that gave it to me. So I kept doing it, but I couldn't afford to teach because I got pregnant. So now I'm 40 with the baby. And I got to do something. Husband works overnight. It's crazy. Um, so I take a job with the superintendent because it's a pay grade. It's a pay raise. Miserable day one. This is not me. You can see I'm very eccentric. I love to. I'm sitting here buttoned up in a suit. I have to be docile. I, I hated it day one. But there was a lesson in a journey. Long and short, I did that for a year. Had some issues with the superintendent. We moved back into the classroom. I took a pay cut at that point, but I knew that's where I needed to be. I did that for about a year. First year, teacher of the year again. New school this time. Students, 85 percentile pass rate. The veteran teachers, are now they don't want to talk to me. They're upset because what did she do? I just closed my door and told my students, when in Vegas, what's in Vegas stays in Vegas. I got the buy-in again. Um, they gave me, of course, the most difficult students who turned out to be the most polished. They could give presentations. They would come dressed in suit and tie when I requested it. You know, the things that was the issue, the marijuana smell, the tiredness, those things slowly but surely went away because they weren't attention grabbers to me. I'd say, go spray yourself, come back and sit down. You're not getting away with it because you came in here under the influence. No. I say, you know, things that, oh, you're you're a gangster. You're not a gangster. Your mother works for Wells Fargo. Sit down. Like I had to meet them where they were at that level. It was tough sometimes. 
but to see children say I act the way I do because my father killed himself. They weren't opening up to other teachers like that. And that's when I said, Jesus, this is big. So then pandemic hit. I come back to work in September. The challenges of teaching during the pandemic, I was one of the teachers who said, I can't do it. So I literally had a nervous breakdown. Like, not a joke. Like, can't get out the bed. Like, I would literally get up, do my Zoom, get back in the bed until I missed the meeting. And my vice principal calls me on the phone. You missed the meeting. You, you okay? And I'm sobbing. Because I would do this in between each class. I would get off the class, cry, fix myself up, get back on the class, cry. So she says, are you okay? And at this moment, I'm sobbing. So I couldn't tell a fib. I said, no, I'm not. We had a conversation. She said, you need to go and take some time for you. I went on a sabbatical. That was in like late September, early October. And in that moment, my doctor told me, start practicing mindfulness, pray, meditate, whatever. So I did. I got my favorite lavender tea. I would pray at a certain time every day. I would listen to a scripture, get back in the bed. Walk my dog, get back in the bed. The dog, by way that I went to rescue because it was part of mindfulness, like I need something. So I went and rescued this huge pit bull that my husband was livid about, but she's my rock. And I would just walk her and listen to what God was putting into me. And he told me, you're going back into entrepreneurship. Okay, great. After a few more months, you're going back into daycare. I could probably do that. Couple more months. You're gonna leave your job in October. Whoa, I'm the breadwinner. I can't do that. And I will slow down, God. By by set by uh January, he had explicitly said, You're gonna take money out your 401k. Money is gonna be released from the IR. Like all of these avenues are about to happen for you. But what happened was I was still and listening to his word as he was implanting it. And I was taking what he was saying until I got to the next bit, until I got to, and it was like dropping pebbles and I was just picking them up and eating them and getting more and more closer to what was gonna happen. And what happened was by October, I quit my job. I had three children that I was caring for in my little loft, but they were enough for me to pay my bills and feel secure enough to say, if I walk away, I'll be okay. I may not be in abundance, but I'll be able to survive. And at this moment, I'd rather survive doing what I love than thrive doing what I hate. So that was my call. So then- And, I, and Tisha, I you, you, said, you said too that um, you were also motivated to open the micro school because of your own children, that it was not only what you were passionate about personally and professionally, but you also saw that it would be right for some of your children. I wonder if you could talk about that. So at the time it was just the daycare. So we opened up the daycares, that was easy. And then by the third month of having the daycare in my house, I found a 2000, a parent found a 2000 square foot building for me to open my daycare. We get licensed as a center for 46 kids. And at that moment, my daughter was going back to high school. My seven year old was then five and she was going to a micro school at the time. I looked at my 17, well, she was 15 at the time. And I said, my husband said, she can't go back to school. I was getting phone calls, if not every day, every other day. She's either having a meltdown, She's getting into it. She won't participate. She just shut down. Nothing we could give her say. Nothing worked until my husband said, we have to pull her. You're going to have to just do her testing at the end of the school year and see what, what happens. And I said, I'll do you one better. I'll just homeschool her. But because my five-year-old went to what looked like a micro school model, I had no idea at the time. I'm like, but I like what she's doing with Zion. We're paying for Zai and my granddaughter to go to school. I think she may be on to something. Let me dig, do a little digging. Because what I did not like about the micro school my daughter went to is the education piece was top notch. My daughter was scholarly, but the social emotional piece was missing. So she was so rigid on the children that the children were almost fearful that if they didn't get it right, it was almost like they felt like they would get a quintessential lashing. And I was like, why are you guys moving like, I get it. I want she wants you to learn, but I want you to be okay mentally, especially having gone through what I've gone through. And then my daughter, I'm watching her go through a breakdown. I had to do something. So in that moment, I told my husband, I think I'm going to start my own micro school. I'm not going to do the charter school thing. It's going to take too long. Our girls need us now. 
Um, and so that's what I did. That so that was that following um October, we opened up Kingdom Kids Empowerment, closed the school, the daycare, and strictly focused on the micro school. And we just had to go all the way and go K through 12 because it encompassed my daughter, both of them, one who was going into the first grade and one that was going into the 11th grade. So I had to do it. And then I have grandchildren. So then, of course, now we have a family of four who's benefiting from being with me all day, every day. I mean, it's great to have homeschool pods and things like that, but to be able to be in a building where it's a little more structured, but I'm still there. Like, this is the best way to parent to me, for me. Right. Yeah. And so then what happened that prompted you to move to this unique space on an HBCU campus? Um, you were saying that you think you're you're the only micro school on, a, on an HBCU campus and just such an interesting mm -hmm. partnership. Share share a little bit about how that came to be and what it's like. I will say that everything I do, I move with God. And so I hope your listeners, whatever faith they have, whatever faith they listen to that, that small voice, because that literally is what leads me. I, I, I can't make this up. I hopped in my vehicle to go get a burrito taco. <laughs> and like I said, something said get up and go, like just get up and go. And so instead of coming right back, I did a spin around the block. And I happened to see them working on the campus. Again, because the campus has lost its accreditation. When you see activity, well, for me, it kind of just sparks my attention. Like, what's going on? Maybe I'm just nosy. I don't know. So, <laughs> so I write up. I say, hey, what are you guys doing? Like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, we're getting the gym ready. We're having a ceremony for the new president. Fast forward, I say, hey, I want to meet the president because I'd like to be a part of what you guys are doing. I have a school. Of course, these people don't know what I'm talking about. Micro school is too new. They're old school. They're looking at me like, okay. So I said, when can I talk to the president? Now, this is gutsy because I have nothing on the calendar for this man. He's the president of the college. They said, come tomorrow. I said, okay. So the next day I come in, not dressed up, you know, just dressed teacher like, and I pop in. You can tell the people are looking like there's a woman in the in the uh, lobby and thinks she's waiting for you. So he pops his head up and he says, I'm with you. And before he could finish, I knew what he was going to ask. I said, no, you don't. But you need to know me because I need to know you. And so he says, he says, oh, really? And he said, well, I'm on my way to a Jack and Jill conference. Walk and talk with me. And so we walked exchange numbers, which I was so hopeful at that moment because he gave me his personal number. That says a lot. So I took his information. And I'm like, I don't want to be too pushy, but I don't want to let this get behind me. So I'll just shoot him a courtesy email. Thank you for taking the time to meet with me. You know, all the things um, to show I have cool. <laughs> and then um, he responded like almost immediately. Pleasure to meet you. Let's set up a time to talk. I'm like, this is God. We ended up meeting the following Friday. Again, I came in com completely myself. I did not come in pretentious. I didn't come in like, like the 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 MBA. I came in like one something for her kiddos and would do what she needed to do to get it. And so I walked in. I was knocking things over. I was silly. Like I, I was very raw and he appreciated that. He was like, you, you're just, you're just you. And I say, yeah, I don't, I don't. And people appreciate that. And, and that's the space that I want my kiddos to be in is to know that you are enough. And so you don't have to put on layers. You can be who you are and that's going to be just enough. So right within a conversation, within 15 minutes of talking, he walked me over to a space that he had in his mind. It was an annex of a church, of the chapel. It had two big rooms that are divided by a, a sliding door, which is perfect for our grades. And we sit across from their student union, which has 26 classrooms. And so our goal is to, and he said this before we could, he said, let's grow together. So that's basically him saying, you know, when you grow, you have this campus and we can pick a few more. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And so I've negotiated to come in here. We haven't paid anything yet. We he's, he's held off on taking a payment until our opportunity scholarship comes in. He's allowed us to do a camp right now um, just to get the feeling that our parents get comfortable. And we're having our first fundraiser 
Family Fun Day on the 29th, right here on the campus, where we'll have Dom from the National uh, Micro School talk to parents about unschooling. I have another parent, talk, uh, another parent who's an educational diagnostician. She's going to come in and talk about the rights of students getting tested in case they need an IEP from their home school. Parents don't know that. I have another mother who's going to talk about the ESA Plus and how her child is benefiting you know, from the monies that he received. And then I have the ICP team coming in to discuss the new SIS platform that is being used and customized for us and giving our parents a tutorial before the first day of school starts. So when I tell you this thing took off the minute we got here, I pray yeah. for people to collaborate with us. It's happening. We have therapists that's coming to our event. Um, we, people are donating haircuts and 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 hair and and, and um uh, hair um getting their hair done for the first day of school. So, you know, all the things that I wanted to do to remain community-based, all the things that I've done in my career are now culminated into this one experience from me working with the um, children with autism and traumatic brain injuries, from me running a daycare in Buffalo, to me working at a homeless center because now I know about McKinney Vento, to me working in a school system because now I know what assessments I do want to do and which ones I don't want to do what type of leader I want to be. Like everything I've done came to a head and here I am. <laughs> Just amazing, Tanisha. How exciting. And so you're opening this fall in the new location on the college campus. Um, and you have about 15 students in kind of true uh, micro school fashion, mixed age, um, elementary, middle school, and high school, yeah. kind of all uh, learning together with yeah. a customized curriculum that, again, is focused on the yeah. whole child. So not just academics, although that's a big part of it, but also that social emotional piece that you find is so critical. And you mentioned um, the EFA funds and the Opportunity Scholarship. North Carolina now has a robust school choice program, and it's enabling many of your students to attend your program tuition free. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about those policies and how that's impacted um, sort of your your accessibility and sort of your vision for the school. Absolutely. We uh, so the vision for the school is built on our core value system, which is HEAL, H-E-A-L, which is holistic health, economic empowerment, academic success and leadership at, and also fellowship development. None of these things can work independently for our program. They have to all work together. It also doesn't work independent to just the child because we believe in Maslow's hierarchy. We believe that the whole child it also encompasses the family that they go home to. So we think with our HEAL model, we think with understanding Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we think knowing social emotional learning is very important. We are excited that North Carolina is also saying, hey, children need choice. Parents need choice. And so I bring the heel piece in it because one, economic empowerment. Listen, resources is a form of economic empowerment. So yes, we teach our children. Matter of fact, we had a bank here yesterday teaching the children the importance of saving and you know doing different bank type things. Great. We are going to teach the teachers how to, the students how to be economically inclined. But how do we also assist and help the parents? We can. And I'm not a proponent of handouts all the time. I'm more about teaching them to fish. And so, if we give the children, if we give the parents this opportunity to be with us, not only are they helping the parent offset that cost, but we're also helping the parent because their child will be a step above because we're giving them a step above what the public or tr traditional school gives them. They're not able to focus on H, the holistic mind, body, and spirit, E, economic empowerment, or even developing the leadership. They only go straight to our A, which is academic success, but that's number three on our list. And so being that we know we have this robust opportunity, this program allows us to give it to those who probably just wouldn't be able to afford it. And that's a beautiful thing. On the other hand, my student who receives the ESA, who is on the autistic autism spectrum, his mother has a master's degree in nursing. She doesn't necessarily fall in um, the low income bucket, but that doesn't mean she doesn't still need and she's still eligible. Now, that one to me is kudos to North Carolina, because this woman, even with a decent income and a two family household, 
the affordability for services for a child on the autism spectrum is very absorbent, exorbitant. So for her to say that it helps her also tells other parents, listen, this is something you can get because what I notice is most of my middle-class parents who pay out of pocket were a little concerned about applying almost as if and most middle class can understand it, we're not going to be eligible. That's how we feel. Nothing is for us. But I was very adamant in explaining, no, no, no. This one, North Carolina has given back to us. Let's be and take full advantage of it. And so we've gotten quite a few parents that went on ahead and took advantage of it. And I mean, how do you feel like this school choice policies, um, you know, impacted your entrepreneurship? I mean, do you think that if w without these funds, without the ESA and the Opportunity Scholarship, would you still be doing what you're doing? Or um, was it really that access um, that made this part of your, your vision? I'm going to say I would just because it's who I am. But mm -hmm. I guess the question would be, would I be able to do it for a long time? <laughs> would it be mm -hmm. sustainable? Would it mm -hmm. be logically sustainable? And the answer to that would be no. Would I probably be donating services? Probably, but that would cause an issue because I'd have to do something to sustain myself financially. Mm -hmm. So that means it would end up being a part-time program or an after-school program, which is not the same as an all-day program. So it would it would have a major impact. Um, I would not be able to do some of the extra things that I'm planning to do this fall because we know that we're getting our first disbursement and so i was able to kind of make some plans as to what our you know what we want to do do we want some extra programming we're going to purchase our um sis application so we were able to not just sustain the program for yet another year but do some cool extra things to add viability to the program Right. You know, when I hear from founders occasionally, uh, especially in states that have passed universal school choice policies or similarly generous programs, and they um, sometimes worry about strings being attached, um, you know, they're worried that they might have to do certain things to comply um, with various state standards to be able to have their families access some of these funds. What was that process like for you uh, and for your school? What did you have to do to become a recognized provider for the program? And, and did you feel like there were, you know, strings that you needed to, uh, to focus on? To be honest, and I can say this from several different aspects, coming from one, the child care space, um, seamless, seamless, seamless process. Everything that we had to do in child care is very, very, um, meticulous. There's a lot of lot of T's, a lot of strings, all of that. However, from the private school side, that was a seamless process. It was a day to become a private school. But then on the ESA side and the Opportunity Scholarship, that did take a little more time. Um, but it was more about systems talking to each other, not about what I needed to do. So it's really like a one page application for ESA plus. You don't need to be an actual teacher. You can really just have a passion for teaching. You can be a tutor. You can be an after-school program. And set up the wallet. Once you go through the administration process, which was the most, the only thing that I would say was tedious of the process was just simply the data, right? Like getting the, the data entry in but once you got that in and they didn't have to kick it back everything you submitted was you know verifiable I was approved less than 30 days for ESA and really ESA was about them sending something back that couldn't upload properly it was like a lot of back and forth but it was not about the process itself simple you don't have to have a master's in business because it's literally a one-page application what are you doing what's your name where are you going to be doing it at and I was very impressed that it was that simple because, again, everyone is not going to have business acumen to fill out, you know, something that you would fill out for the secretary of state. Everyone's not going to have that. And it would put some people off. The opportunity scholarship was a little more grueling only because and I'm a checklist person. You really need to go and do check by check, step by step. You cannot do one step before the rest. 
some things you need to have a in service or webinar before you can even move forward. So again, it was more about procedural, but if you're excited about doing the work and you want to be able to be sustainable, again, it's seamless when it comes down to the opportunity scholarship, because what we have to do for the child care space is a three, four month process minimal. This took me maybe a week to do the Opportunity Scholarship in its entirety. Um, I had to ask one question to someone who could support me. But other than that, it did not take, again, an MBA to get access to these funds. Oh, that's great to hear. Okay. Yeah. And so what is your sense for the future then, Tanisha? Um, you know, you're a micro school with 15 students. How big do you want to get? Uh, what are your sort of thoughts for the school over the coming year and beyond? Yes. So huh, originally when I started this, I was like, oh, no, I'm just going to stay in this one room schoolhouse. And, you know, and that, that that's that's nice. But there are several reasons why that won't work. One, I'm leaving too much on the table for children who need what we have. And that's not fair. I feel like I'm not doing my due diligence as a servant leader. Um, number two, it's not cost effective. Like it does, if you know, unfortunately, if you are an entrepreneur, you cannot forget that the preneur is a thing. And so if you if you if you if you have not done a, a true budget, find someone who can assist you in doing so because when you see that the one and two is not the one and one is not equaling two, it can be discouraging. And so it's better to see it in black and white. Know what you need to get. Know your numbers. That is a big one for me when I coach women in business. Know your numbers. I don't care if that's your home budget. How much does it cost to run your home? You need to know that and back it in. And so I knew my numbers. I know that 15, 16 kids, I don't want to go over that for quality sake. And so my goal is to go to every HBCU that I can find and ask them for a space and replicate my my program across the East Coast. Wow, oh my goodness, that would be so exciting. Uh, have you started that process or you're just I have. still I, seeing I, how it's gonna go? I, nope, I reached out to Morris Brown already because I have the connection there and then I'm on the cusp of reaching out to A&T. That's gonna be a harder push, but I do, have communication with the director of education there. So, and then I'm, I, I looked at Livingstone, but the proximity from here to there, it wouldn't make sense. So I've just mapped out those. And then Winston, Salem State may be on there. Again, these are three places that I have connections. And so I could at least walk in and have the conversation. And um, as we're developing this infrastructure, I'm not interested in the infrastructure being perfect because that's the beauty of a micro school. Right. If it's so structured, then it's traditional. <laughs> like, you got to kind of be flexible. But I do, for the sake of uh, sustainability of the program, do you know you do need to have some level of structure. It is a business still. So just getting that model tight, but understanding that each area that I go into may need something different and remaining flexible to give them that. I may go to Atlanta and they may say, no, we want more technology. And so I'm flexible with giving it, a, instead of it being an empowerment academy, making it a technology academy. And I may go to Winston and they may want a lot of gardening. And so we'll make it an agricultural academy. But the point is, we give the people what we want, which is the definition of a micro school. And what is so attractive um, of the HBCU model? What What is attracting you to that campus location? What do you find so special about the opportunity there? I mean, a college is a college. I could do, you know, I would do any college. I just went where the opportunity led me. And once I got there, I could feel that this was safe. Now, here's the thing. I'm on an HBCU campus, but I have three kiddos who are not black they're caucasian and they love it their parents love it because that's the other piece those children probably will never experience but guess what they are and vice versa um but what attracted me was really opportunity and when opportunity presents you need to be available and so because this is the lane that i'm in and i know that it's a micro lane no pun intended with micro schools but being that you have big colleges, but then you go down and funnel them to the HBCU. My opportunity of being able to spread my program is a lot 
easier than if I tried to tackle, you know, you have to drill down. And so it presented itself, yes, but it makes good business sense as well because it's niched, it's pocketed for me, and there's a lot of struggling HBCU. So there's yet another opportunity for us to be collaborative, bring visibility to not just my program, but to theirs as well. Garner more resources collectively. And so it's the each one teach one, one hand washes the other. To me, that makes sense. Incredible. And maybe you'll move on to the remaining 4,000 colleges and universities. Right. Put some more pressure on me, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> but it is such a great model, especially your point around, uh, you know, there's so many colleges and universities now that are, are struggling with enrollment declines and financial security and this sort of partnership micro school model um, could be, you know, a way of in increasing visibility, like you said, and increasing some financial stability for these colleges and universities. So it could be a win-win all around. Yeah. yeah. So, so less expensive yeah. for us to be here. So it makes sense. So Tanisha, um, as we begin to wrap up, I'd love to hear, you know, sort of some of your predictions or thoughts on the future of unconventional education, the micro school movement? Do you feel like we're just the beginning of this? Do you feel like the future is bright? Uh, you know, what are some of your thoughts on where this is going? I feel like we're about to enter into a phase where we're going to be imitated. And I'm concerned about that because I don't want us to be watered down. I've already seen it happening with Charlotte Mecklenburg's schools piloting a micro school they didn't call it a micro school but it has all of the tenets of a micro school and so I think they're going to infiltrate a space that should be unique and reserved for educators who are truly passionate and not just willing to work um education is 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 very delicate right now particularly in North Carolina um because we're one of the lowest paid um, so the teachers have the passion, they're tired, they're under-resourced, there's just a lot of variables. Um, true educators who want to do this, great, but big organizations like school districts that want to funnel and push, this is about organic education, not about fancy education, not about big old boards. Like, we can get those things, but what makes it fun and effective is that it's organic, we can go outside today and eat out there versus, you know, we can, I, I don't want to see that happen to us. So I'm almost like want us to be the best kept secret, but I know that can't happen if we want to get more kiddos. So what I would hope to see is that we have micro schools everywhere, like we have daycares and they eventually get funded with public school funds, not just the opportunity scholarship, the same way that charter school receives those funds. We should get a piece of that. Um, because the work we're doing is for the ones, this is what I say, last thing I say, if a school has 30 children in a classroom, you can spare five. Let me have, so now you have 25. I have five, I'm helping you, not hindering you. We're working together because those five are outliers. They need something more that the teachers can't give them. I know this because I was a teacher. My ESL students, I couldn't reach them, so I would watch them sit there and do nothing. And I felt helpless because I can't do anything. I cannot teach you. I can't speak Arabic. So now imagine if those five students had a place for themselves. I didn't take from you, school district. I added value because the kids are still going to have their data under your district. So we're working in tandem. So that's what I would like to see. Reciprocity on funding and don't take up our space we have it under control. <laughs> yeah, and just working to meet the needs of each child. Um, like you said, these large school districts, it's just difficult to meet, to have that individualized education and to meet individual needs uh, in that kind of environment. So um, you can't do hopefully it. we'll see more education entrepreneurs like you. I'm certainly seeing that from my vantage point and uh, excited to see where this goes. So if my listeners and viewers would like to connect with you, Tanisha, find out more about Kingdom Kids Empowerment Academy, what is the best way for them to do that? We are active on social media. We're on Instagram at 
KK Empowerment Academy. Um, you can also follow us on uh, Facebook, same thing. And you can join us on our website, our web, I'm, I'm sorry, our uh, list. You can go on our mailing list, which is kkmpoweracademy.com. We love new visitors. We love new foot traffic. We try to keep it updated with nice pictures. Same thing with Instagram. Follow us, share our page, show some comments. Uh, we love to hear what you guys think about what we're doing. Amazing. Well, I am so excited to follow your growth and your progress and your expansion, hopefully into new HBCU campuses and beyond over the coming years. Tanisha DaCosta, thank you so much for being on the Liberated Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. It's been an awesome time.